world we live in runs on computers and software, and those things run on code. It's how we give instructions that machines can understand. There's long been a shortage of people who can write code, and as the need for that code has exploded, it's one more space where artificial intelligence is having an impact. Generative AI tools are changing the way code gets made, especially GitHub's Copilot. More than 100 million programmers use GitHub, which is an online platform where people develop software. And in this latest installment of our oral history project, we meet CEO Thomas Donkey. I'm Jennifer Strong, and this is Shift. Now here on the steering column is a device called AutoCruise. You simply set the speed you want. Self-driving robo-taxis are already on the road in two years. How the disc rotates, a mirror reflects the light in the way that depends on how the signal was recorded. This is the 100 terabyte action I present to you Electro, the Mono Man. Ladies and gentlemen. I would say that one of my greatest skills is my ability to interact with humans. Throughout this series, we'll be featuring the stories of breakthroughs and other key moments in emerging tech, as told by those who witnessed them. Hackers and cyber criminals have always held this kind of special fascination. Obviously, I can't tell you too much about what I do. It's a game. Who's the best hacker? And I was like, well, this is child's play. I'm Dina Temple Raston, and on the Click Here podcast, you'll meet them and the people trying to stop them. We're not afraid of the attack. We're afraid of the creativity and the intelligence of the human being behind it. Click Here, stories about the people making and breaking our digital world. AI machines, satellite, engine ignition, click here, and lift off. Every Tuesday, wherever you get your podcasts. We can actually see how much code is written by the human, the pilot, if you will, in, in that file. And on average, this is now 46% coming from the model and then the rest from the developer, right? So half, on average, half comes from AI. Some programming languages, you know, one popular is Java. Uh, it's actually 62% coming from the model. Hey, I'm Thomas Domke. I'm a developer and I'm also the CEO of GitHub. GitHub is a platform where software developers from all around the world build software, build, you know, applications, whether they're open source, whether they're closed source within their companies, their startups, big enterprises. It's a platform for developers to collaborate, to share ideas, to share source code ultimately, and uh, build the world of tomorrow. We are now recording this in June of 2023. And three years ago, in June 2021, a machine learning model called GPT-3, a transformer model, just had come out from OpenAI. And um, my team at GitHub got access to it, and we were asking ourselves the question, what can we do with the technology? It was great. We saw a lot of demos of how it can, you know, predict the next word or uh, the next three words or even synthesize a couple of paragraphs of text. And, and people were uh, back then already blown away by uh, sometimes that writes a very cohesive summary of a historical event or an NBA game report or something like that. And so we ask, we ask ourselves the question, can we use it to uh, write codes, write source code in a programming language? We actually start with a language called Python, um, used by many programmers, not only for regular coding, but also for machine learning. And we played with you know Python and saw um, that it could synthesize whole methods, complex algorithms. In fact, it was able to solve 92% of the programming exercises that we were using for interview loops, right? So when candidates apply for jobs at GitHub, they have to do technical exercises to prove that they can actually code. And so, you know, we get a description and, and then have to write a method um, and to show us um, how, how good your coding skills are. And back three years ago, the model was already able to, to write 92% of the code. So we, we thought, oh, we should build a product around this and be partnered with Microsoft and OpenAI to evolve both the model and, and build a product uh, on top of it, and that we now call GitHub Copilot. 
developers spend most of their day in an editor, a text editor. They write code, it's just text. And you can kind of imagine in the morning they start with an empty file and they have to come up with all the words in the programming language they have to write. And so when they write in the editor, Copilot suggests, you know, the next word and it can suggest the whole line or maybe multiple lines. We call it a method or a function, a unit test, which is code that tests other code, you know, code to connect to an internet service, you know, to upload a file or download text data or stock prices and, and whatnot. And Copilot helps you with doing that. And so developers that use this technology, when they write, they basically have an assistant available to them all the time to get the job done. Without Copilot, what developers do is they switch between the editor and the browser all the time, right? Like no matter what you're writing in life, you always have to look something up eventually. You always get to that point where you like need to do some research or need to read documentation or just ask somebody on an internet forum. And so we have this context switch all the time. And if your browser looks like mine, it has like all these tabs open with all the other things in my life, you know, the vacation I'm planning and the shoes I want to buy, you know, maybe that argument about who won the Formula One race last weekend, those kind of things, right? So you're distracted by your browser and you're distracted by the context switch. In fact, I think, you know, our human brains are really bad at switching back and forth between different topics. And the co-pilot, we don't need you to switch to your browser anymore. You just get all the help in your workplace, in your in your work environment, your, your editor. You know, we started working on this idea in mid 2020, June 2020, and then uh, we launched what we call a preview one year later in June 2021, basically gave some people access to the product, have them try it out and over time ramped that up until ultimately a year ago in June 2022, we launched Copilot um, to the to the public. Everybody could now sign up for an account and try it out. And in that year, um, more than a million users have started working with Copilot and that gives us a lot of data insights. And so if you see a steady increase of developers adopting this technology and then benefiting from it by having, you know, the AI uh, taking all the busy work and having the developer focus on all the creative work uh, and on the actual business problems or the actual technical problems they're trying to solve. And so we see that productivity gain in how much code is written by Copilot. Um, we also ask ourselves, well, what happens if you give one team Copilot and the other one doesn't have Copilot? You know, it's kind of like a case study and you give everybody the same task and we ask them to build a web server, you know, you know, normal developers would say, well, I got it. Don't worry about it. I can figure that out easily. The group with Copilot was 55% faster in that standardized task. They got it done in an hour and 10 minutes versus two hours and 40 minutes, something like that. But not only that, the group with Copilot also had a higher success rate. And so they got it done more often than the group without Copilot, right? You always have some developers who can't get to a full solution um, of the problem that you're giving them. This is going to fundamentally change of how software developers work. It, we, we see already a linkage between you know, software development and AI. It will become part of the standard tool set of every developer. And in fact, I believe Copilot and, and ChatGPT and similar tools will be part of every human's tool set, uh, whether in personal life or in professional life. We named it Copilot for a reason, right? We named it Copilot because we believe a pilot is always going to be involved and, and the developer in our world of software development tools is that it's the pilot. These machine learning models that we have today, um, they're not sentient, they're not creative. They need an input, they need a trigger from a human for a question, you know, a, a snippet of text, something to summarize. And then they apply statistics, effectively math, to predict the output. It's a probability machine. It cannot actually think, cannot learn. Funny enough, you know, we call this machine learning, but it's really machine training. We take a, you know, a data set and we take a, a model architecture and, and then basically we tune the parameters, the numbers in that model, change those numbers uh, to a certain, in a certain way. And then that model is static for the rest of its life. And maybe there's a new model version down the road, but a model doesn't learn like human learns, right? It cannot, it cannot add vocabulary, it cannot add skills, cannot learn how to be humorous, which is very different to how we are as humans uh, and how we grow through, through the journey of our lives. And so the pilot is, is, is the human. The pilot is the developer that decides what to build and what not to build. And with the help of AI, the job of the developer will change in the way that 
developers always have very big problems to solve. That was always the case. It's just the scale has you know, fundamentally changed. We are now having much bigger software systems than we had 30, 40 years ago. Something like Facebook, uh, Google, or you know, ChatGPT itself would have been unimaginable in the 80s, not only because you know we didn't have the compute power, we also didn't have the internet, we didn't have the data sets, we didn't have the technological skills to run such a large scale system. And so we're managing millions, billions, if not trillions of lines of code, and that's only ever growing. Banks still running source code from the 60s on, on mainframes. COBOL is the program language on mainframes. And they see no easy path to get out of this. And that's the code from the 60s. We're not talking about the code from the 70s, the 80s and 90s and so on, right? And so we are naturally sitting on a pile of software that's ever going. And so we need to extend our skills to handle all that existing legacy code base, transform some of that over into the future while building even more complex, larger systems. And so the de job of the developer will change from somebody who writes very low level code and it used to be punch cards and then it was, you know, machine language. And in the 80s, you had to understand, you know, how the CPU works and uh, that it has a cache and a uh, slow memory and then cassette tape or, you know, a disk drive, which was even slower than the slow memory compared to the cache, compared to the registered in the GP, uh, CPU. And today, most people don't have that systems level understanding anymore um, of how a computer works on, a, on an individual basis. They think much more at a larger scale of many computers working together, you know, databases, storage systems, regions of, of the cloud, right? Regions of the cloud where do you store the data in the United States or in Europe, or do we have actually a system that works across all the continents? And, and so the developer will become this system architect that is able to analyze the problem and to design a system, you know, and there's big differences between software running, for example, in a grocery store, right? Your point of sales system versus the software running in your car versus the software running on your cell phone versus, you know, the software running at a cloud provider or a social network, right? And the requirements for these systems are massively different and you wouldn't want to run Facebook in your supermarket and have basically your checkout system be scalable for 3 billion customers because you're never going to have 3 billion customers in the supermarket. Right. And so the developer has to make those decisions, those creative decisions, those architecture decisions. And then what they're going to do is they break this huge problem down into small pieces. Right. And ultimately, they arrive at a small unit, kind of like a Lego brick, where they know now I can leverage AI to synthesize the code for this. Right. And, and maybe the size of the Lego brick is going to grow or the number of Lego bricks you have available, actually very similar to real Lego, where it used to be just a two by four and a, and a one by four and whatnot. And now it's like, I don't know, thousands of different Lego pieces that you can have in your collection. We have all these building blocks. AI will help us to write the code for this. And then the human will bring that all together to the innovative systems that we need for the world of tomorrow. Jobs have always changed and, and gone away. And I think, you know, there is job categories that probably are going to dramatically change. If you think about um, trans simultaneous translation uh, at conferences as an example, I, I can see a world very quickly where we just put our headphones in uh, and they already have a mic and they have noise cancelling and, and they're really good at synthesizing audio and then we already see machine learning models that can uh, sound like me. Uh, and so now you just have to bring it together where the machine learning model listens to what I'm saying in English and then translate to Brazilian Portuguese, emulating my voice. And so if you're from Brazil and you're listening to a speech of mine in English, you will hear me speaking in Brazilian Portuguese, even though I couldn't be farther away from speaking Brazilian Portuguese. Actually, even in the conversation, you can kind of imagine that you say something and then your, your headphones pick it up. And then it's through your phone, you know, send it to my headphones, translate it back into English, right? And so I can see that, you know, some of those jobs are going to go away and those, those workers will go through their digital transformation into, into new category of jobs. In fact, you know, I spoke with um, the head of production of a, of a German automaker and he said that they're actually upskilling factory workers, blue color factory workers into white color software developers. GitHub today has 100 million developers, and I think we're going to look at a future where we probably have a billion developers around the world, where because we can use human language to write code, that also means we use German language to control the machine. And I think that, in, in many ways, is a great path forward for us. So if you look you know, at the productivity gains that we're seeing from Copilot, how much code Copilot is writing and how it makes developers faster, we're actually 
really excited about the time between now and 2030 or so because A, we have a lot of problems to solve in this world and we don't have enough software developers. We don't get enough students out of college that learn computer science. We have a shortage of developers in the market and that shortage is only going to increase. And so then we bring this technology in that makes developers more productive, which helps us to shorten that gap. That doesn't mean actually we replace all the developers with AI. It only means that enable us in, in, in our world to accelerate human progress. And if we apply you know, just the statistics we have from today, the productivity gains, uh, we assume it's about 30% pessimistically. That means by 2030, we will have a 1.5 trillion positive impact on the GDP just through developer tools alone, right? just through developer productivity. That doesn't include any of the impact from other industries where AI might be applied. You know, like agriculture, where you can use AI to predict the weather and, and the soil and, and whatnot. And that is only with the technology that we have today. I actually think in the years to come, as we are really in early days of generative AI, those productivity gains will be much larger, which then also means that the GDP impact will be larger, maybe, maybe even double from that 1.5 trillion. One thing that I'm particularly excited about is to bring software development to many more people around the world, specifically kids. If you look at our children today, when they start school, they may learn a foreign language. And sometimes they get into technology often because, you know, their parents are already in technology and um, the, they might get them into something like Scratch, a tool from MIT that lets kids use visual elements to code. But it's it's still really hard to get into the intricacies of software development, especially if you're not in an English-speaking country, because software development still is predominantly English. Documentation is in English, you know, software comments are in English. The, the language we use to collaborate on platforms like GitHub is predominantly English. If you want to file an issue, you know, with an open source project, more likely than not, you're expected to file your issue in English. With Copilot, we are enabling a whole new world of software developers, of children to become software developers. Because at the age of five or six, they can just start coding by asking co-pilot questions. And they can ask those questions not only in English, but also in, in German and in Hindi and Mandarin or um, you know Spanish. And they can even ask it to then generate their code with English comments, right? This is similar to, you know, when you use uh, an image model like Stable Diffusion or, or Midjourney and you prompt it to render some art and we've all kind of like already learned that then you do comma as if it were painted by Picasso, comma, you know, you kind of like add those things to the prompt to get a different output. Well, the same is true when you use Copilot in coding. Um, you can write a very simple command like create the code for a snake game, but you can also say create a code for a snake game in JavaScript. Create the code for a snake game in JavaScript with English comments and explain that code to me in German, right? And so that opens a whole new world where I think, you know, we should get to the point where every six-year-old learns coding as part of their basic education. Because, you know, you overcome the fear <laughs> of AI by being able to control the machine. We'll be back right after this. This show is produced by me and Anthony Green with help from Emma Silicons. It's mixed by Garrett Lang with original music from him and Jacob Gorski. Thanks for listening. I'm Jennifer Strong. <laughs>